Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Discovering the FDA-Cleared Acuitous AMR Gene Panel, Building a Case for Clinical Utility. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by OpGen. To learn more, visit opgen.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Dr. Stefan Riedel, Associate Medical Director, Clinical Microbiology Laboratories at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, an Associate Professor of Pathology at Harvard Medical School, and Dr. Tresh Simner, Associate Professor of Pathology, John Hopkins University School of Medicine, and Director of the Medical Bacteriology and Infectious Disease Sequencing Laboratories, Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Riedel and Dr. Simner, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for the kind introduction. Today, Dr. Simner and I will present on the FDA cleared Acutus AMR panel and its potential clinical utility. Listed here are Dr. Simner's and my various disclosures regarding today's presentation. The learning objectives are the following. We will first describe the FDA cleared Acutus AMR panel then define the performance characteristics of the Acutus AMR panel, and then discover the potential utility of the Acutus AMR panel to impact patient care. But first, let's begin with a brief perspective on the era of antibiotics. Since their initial discovery, antibiotics have been major pillars of modern medicine and not only allowed for cure of previously untreatable infectious diseases, but also contributed to major advances in various other areas of medicine and surgery. However, the antibiotic era has been rather short compared to the long time that bacteria and other microorganisms have been around. Many antibiotics that were discovered in the past are actually produced by various microorganisms, and therefore it should be appreciated that antimicrobial resistance genes have also been around for an equally long time. Although antimicrobial resistance is not a new phenomenon, resistance rates have been increasing during the last three decades at an unprecedented rate. Using the iceberg analogy, it has become clear over the past decades that there was, is, and continues to be a lot more to learn and understand about antimicrobial resistance development. AMR is a complex and dynamic issue involving aspects of intrinsic resistance, resistance in environmental bacteria, and sharing of resistance genes among various bacterial pathogens. I want to draw your attention to the fact that it is now ever more so appreciated that the various ways human societies utilize antibiotics, however, have been major contributing factors to the emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistance. While antimicrobial resistance was recognized almost immediately at or around the time of discovery of antibiotics and their use in clinical patient care during the beginnings of the antibiotic era some 80 years ago, the problem of AMR has only come to center stage some 25 years ago. Today, an estimated 235 million doses of antibiotics are consumed in the United States. At the same time, more than 2.8 million infections due to antimicrobial biotic resistant organisms with more than 35,000 deaths are recorded in the US annually. Globally, the problem is even bigger, with almost 1 million deaths due to AMR infections. Nothing changes. It is estimated that by 2050, the mortality due to infectious diseases with resistant organisms will surpass the mortality due to cancer and many other diseases. 
The 2019 CDC AMR threat report further highlights this problem. Despite the improvements due to preventative measures, such as antimicrobial stewardship programs and other interventions since the 2013 threat assessment report, increases in various infection types and especially AMR organisms have been noted. The CDC especially highlights the threat due to ESBL-producing Enterobacterialis, MDR Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Carbapenem-resistant Enterobacterialis in this latest report. <clears throat> AMR has a significant impact not only on an individual patient's health, but has an impact on the overall health system. Many studies have investigated and highlighted the impact on length of stay on the economic burden as listed here on the slide. While antimicrobial stewardship programs as required by CMS for US hospitals participating in the Medicare Medicaid programs are helpful in mitigating the AMR problem in some healthcare settings, uh, sorry, in some healthcare settings, rates of AMR infections continue to increase. Again, having a significant health economic impact given the fact that infections due to AMR pathogens are associated with longer hospital length of stay. The question to ask here now is how improvements in diagnostic laboratory testing methods could contribute to solutions for the AMR problem. In this respect, we can readily identify certain patient populations that would clearly benefit from utilizing rapid AMR tests. Such patients include the immunocompromised, oncology and organ transplant patients as they are at higher risk of developing infections due to AMR pathogens. Now listed here are the current and standard approaches that laboratories may use for antimicrobial susceptibility testing. While many of these test methods have been around for decades, they have been proven to be useful and laboratories and clinicians alike are very familiar with the performance characteristics of such methods. Please note, however, that all of these methods are inevitably based on organism growth and exposure to a specific antimicrobial agent. In the past time, these culture-based phenotypic susceptibility test methods are still the predominant and routine methods in most laboratories in the US. In fact, some of the oldest methods, such as the drop microdilution testing, are considered to be a reference method or what we call a gold standard. Furthermore, regulatory agencies such as the FDA, CLSI, and UCAS have established standards for guidelines for AST performance and interpretation of the results. Again, laboratories and clinicians alike are very familiar with these guidelines for daily use in their clinical practice. However, the turnaround time results by these methods are often rather lengthy, depending on an individual laboratory's workflow. AST results are typically available anywhere between 36 and 72 hours after a patient's specimen has been received for culture and testing. <clears throat> During the past decades, great progress has been made to develop rapid diagnostic methods. These include methods for rapid organism ID, such as MALDI-TOF, or panel-based ID and AST molecular tests often used directly from primary patient specimens, such as, such as the BioFire, the Verigene system, EPLEX, or Cepheid expert test system. These are all shown on this slide. Numerous studies during the past decades have also demonstrated that rapid organism identification is indeed helpful in conjunction with antimicrobial stewardship programs to implement more judicious use of antibiotics. This study highlighted here on this slide shows that such impact has been readily seen with infections due to gram-positive organisms and reduction of unnecessary use of angromycin, for example. However, infections due to gram-negative bacteria continue to be a challenge, even with the use of currently available multiplex PCR tests. Rapid organism identification coupled with testing for a few selected resistance genes, followed by standard phenotypic susceptibility testing, is an approach taken by many laboratories today to support the clinical approach to treating infectious diseases from empiric therapy to targeted antibiotic therapy. Now, the majority of these 
current test methods share some of the same narrow selection of resistance genes listed on the left side of the slide. However, these test methods do not offer a comprehensive antimicrobial susceptibility profile, and many of these tests are typically performed on primary patient specimens, therefore requiring dedicated panels for each type of specimen or sample. And lastly, none of these tests directly link the identified AMR marker or gene to the organism that has been detected. While the gap between specimen submission and organism identification has now been shortened, the turnaround time for susceptibility test results has not changed, and therefore often widens the turnaround time gap between organism ID and the final phenotypic susceptibility test results. So the question today is, what would change if a molecular, more comprehensive test method with a reasonably shorter turnaround time was available to detect multiple AMR genes, and how would this test impact patient care? I would now like to turn it over to Dr. Simner to describe and discuss the Acutus AMR gene panel. Thank you, Dr. Riedel. Uh, thank you for going over the problem which is that of antimicrobial resistance, this global pu public health threat, and describing some of the solutions, that whether that be uh, rapid diagnostics to help us address uh, antimicrobial stewardship or infection control initiatives. One of those rapid diagnostics that was recently FDA cleared is the Acutus AMR gene panel. So what is this panel? Um, what effect does it have on patient care? or the potential effect on patient care, and uh, what are its performance characteristics. So uh, we'll attempt to achieve that in the remainder of this uh, presentation. So the Acutus AMR gene panel is a multiplex real-time PCR assay for the detection and differentiation of 28 antimicrobial resistance markers, which can be associated with not susceptible antimicrobial susceptibility results up to nine uh, antimicrobial classes or subclasses. Uh, so you'll see here in the table the list of the antimicrobial agents and the antibiotics that can be associated with those particular agents. The association will vary based off of the organisms being tested. And so what do we um, test on this panel? Well, we perform the panel on isolated colonies. Uh, these colonies can be from blood agar or McConkie agar and can be from Enterobacterales, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, or Enterococcus faecalis. So I want to point out here two unique items about the Acutus AMR gene panel. It's one of the broadest, or it is the broadest FDA cleared AMR panel now with up to 28 antimicrobial resistance genes that tests a broader spectrum of beta-lactamase genes, but also resistance genes to associate to resistance to aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, and trimethoprim sulfa methoxazole. And the second point is that you're, that we're able to associate those resistance genes with uh, not susceptible resist, uh, results to help us with determining appropriate therapy. So addressing our stewardship or even detecting those AMR genes to um, a, a detect um, infection, to help with infection control initiatives. So what is the workflow for the Acutus AMR gene panel? Well, the Acutus panel is really these uh, provides 96 well plate panels for which the 96 well for which the multiplex PCR is performed. But first, you'll take your extracts from your or you'll take your isolate uh, of interest and you'll extract it, extract it on the Kyogen Easy One system. The, you'll then take the extract and the master mix provided by the kit and add that um, to the first three columns of your PCR 96 well PCR plate. And you can see here in the image that you could test up to four isolates per panel on a single 96 well plate. You'll then centrifuge that, uh, fill the plate up with your four organisms, seal it, centrifuge it, and place it on the Quant Studio 5 real time PCR system, where a PCR protocol is run for 45 minutes. You'll then take the, the results from there, upload it to the option analysis software, which will generate a report. So 
from sample from the beginning to the end is 2.5 hour turnaround time with approximately 30 minutes hands-on time. So this is a semi-automated method. It's not a sample to answer approach, but it has removed a lot of um, the manual steps uh, through automation, but still uh, involves some user interaction. So what do the uh, reports look like for the CUTIS AMR gene panel? Well, the first uh, page of the report outlines the agents, um, the AMR genes as listed as detected or not detected. And this is based off of the ID that's selected in the drop-down menu. So based off of the organism identification, it will uh, reflect the results appropriate for that identification. Um, and then on the second page, it will summarize um, at the top in the table, it lists the on-panel genes that are associated with the not susceptible agents for that particular drug-bug combination. And at the bottom in the last table, it lists the agents on the panel that are either not associated or not reportable for that particular organism that you chose in the drop-down menu. So the, the next question is, is uh, where does this fit into the current diagnostic uh, spectrum? And so uh, our standard methodologies um, allow us uh, to detect, to provide ID and identification and susceptibility testing results within about two to three days, as Dr. Riedel pointed out in his initial slides. We've luckily over the last 10 decades had many new toys or diagnostic tools uh, that have been helped us help us to more rapidly detect antimicrobial resistance. These can be anything from simplex or multiplex molecular panels performed direct from specimen uh, to the next day from the recovered isolate where you could provide a rapid MALDI ID, but also perform additional testing to define antimicrobial resistance like the PBP2A for detection of methicillin resistant staph aureus, Alternatively, chromogenic ag agars can be helpful based off of the antimicrobial agents in the media, media to select for VRE or carbapenem resistant organisms. You could also use targeted PCRs from cultured isolates. But on the flip side, we're seeing some more advanced diagnostics being introduced, like whole genome sequencing, which is gaining traction, but it is still very um, manual, requires a lot of expertise. It's manual, both from a molecular expertise standpoint, but also from a bioinformatics expertise standpoint. But it really is something that we look forward to in the clinical microbiology lab. There's also the Accelerate Pheno system, which is a rapid phenotypic AST method that can be performed from positive blood cultures that provides rapid ID and AST within seven and a half hours from a positive blood culture. This is where the cutest AMR gene panel fits in, in terms of comparator, in terms of time, uh, time to results and uh, where it would be performed. So you would be isolating your organism ID and then maybe in parallel or after that ID is, uh, is um, obtained from Aldi, you would move forward with the acutus AMR gene panel to provide results within two and a half hours post uh, Maldi ID. And then further down the line, if you do your standard AST, some additional testing may be required uh, to define mechanisms of resistance like the, uh, um, the CARBA-NP or the modified uh, carbapenem inactivation method that can help define whether a carbapenem resistant organism is due to carbapenemase production or not. So what is the performance characteristics of the CUTIS AMR gene panel? Well, this was uh, evaluated uh, through a multi-center study uh, for FDA clearance of the assay. So this is the data presented here is the data that was submitted to the FDA for, FD for clearance, uh, for 510K clearance of this assay. The publication was submitted to the Journal of Clinical Microbiology. And the purpose of this study was to establish the per performance characteristics of the acuitous AMR gene panel compared to a combined reference standard. Um, and I'll go over that combined reference standard in a second. But the overall study um, involved four different geographically diverse sites, which included Cleveland Clinic, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, Wadsworth Center, as well as IHMA. And isolates were chosen to be uh, included in the study based off of previous being, previously being identified as one of the panel targets organisms, um, not targets, but organisms that are able to be tested, such as Enterobacterales, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, or Enterococcus faecalis. 
a total of 1,300 isolates were tested across these sites with 1,200 retrospective isolates and 83 prospective isolates. The comparator to the acutus AMR gene panel was, the whole, was whole genome sequencing for the detection of AMR genes with an endpoint of approximately, uh, with a, a, a primary endpoint for AMR markers of 95% positive percent and negative percent agreement. Um, and then from the prediction or the, not prediction, but association of antimicrobial susceptibility results, um, standard phenotypic uh, broth microdilution methods were the comparator where for a marker to be associated with a not susceptible result, it had to meet both criteria of at least 95% positive percent and negative percent agreement for detection of an AMR marker, but also to meet uh, an at least uh, meet and surpass a 80% positive predictive value for correlation to that phenotypic not susceptible result. So the clinical performance in, comparative, in comparison to whole genome sequencing for detection of the AMR market, uh, markers by reportable gene um, ranged from 94.4% to 100% uh, for PPA for positive percent agreement and 96.5 to 100 for negative percent agreement. Initially, um, 31 AMR markers were uh, submitted to the FDA, but only 28 are included in the final FDA uh, version. And you'll notice here that the endpoint of 95 is a little bit lower here, down to 94.4%. This is uh, because the FDA um, decided to clear uh, MCR1 uh, at a slightly lower uh, level of 94.4% uh, PPA. And then in addition, um, based off, so for each organism, um, claimed organism that can be performed on this panel, the, the based off of the species level um, data, uh, the reportable AMR markers varies based off of the species. So it could be anywhere from one AMR marker being reported, such as Enterococcus faecalis and San A, or the Providentia species in NDM, all the way up to a more expanded um, spectrum of AMR genes reported for some of the more common gram negatives that we encounter, like E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Proteus mirabilis, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So any discrepant results that were encountered uh, between whole genome sequencing and the acutus AMR panel were divided into two groups. One was uh, just due to sample error or mix-up where different organism identifications were obtained um, or inconsistent results on sample replicates uh, were obtained. And so those results uh, uh, were uh, resulted in some discrepancies, but there are also some AMR gene level discrepancies, such as variants that didn't have valid alignments with the primer and probes, or the presence of truncated genes that could result in a false positive by the acutus AMR, um, or a high number of uh, primer num mismatches resulting in false negatives where the primer probes uh, did not pick up particular variants. However, there were so few of these, and the impact of discrepant analysis would not have impacted the results that um, this was not pursued in this study. So the last part of the Acuitous uh, AMR panel is the, and the most exciting part, is the ability to not only detect AMR genes, but also associate that, that gene with the, with, um, with not susceptible results, so intermediate or resistant results to particular agents. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that if you detect a resistance gene, the, the, the probability of that organism carrying a resistant marker being not susceptible to the expected agents is at least 80%. I must note here that the phenot that this does not replace phenotypic AST and that this is an adjunct to uh, traditional or conventional methods um, and that this method is associating the detection of a resistance gene with the probability of um, not susceptible results to those agents uh, identified, um, but they are not predictive in terms of the the absence predicts susceptibility versus the presence predicts resistance. So there is a difference there and should be noted. So in conclusion, this study um, found that the acutus AMR gene panel is an accurate method to detect a broad array of AMR markers among cultured isolates. The AMR markers were further associated with expected not susceptible results for spe specific agent-organism combinations. And these associated agents included 
uh, many of the, include many of the most commonly prescribed antimicrobial agents, including beta-lactams, fluoroquinolones, trimethoprim, sulfonavoxazole, and aminoglycosides. Um, these results have the potential to guide patient care at least a day earlier than conventional phenotypic AST methods and can be applied to support stewardship and infection control programs. But that leaves us with the ultimate question is, what is the clinical utility of this diagnostic for patient care? And so, so Dr. Riedel and I are going to try to address this through three hypothetical cases. And I'll start us off with case one. So this is a case of a 23-year-old, otherwise healthy male who underwent surgery for appendicitis. He developed sepsis in the post-operative period. He was febrile, hypotensive, and tachycardic. So blood cultures were collected and the patient was empirically started on ceftriaxone and metronidazole, where the ceftriaxone allows for broad gram-negative and streptococcal coverage, and the metronidazole allows for intestinal anaerobic coverage. So the blood culture for this patient signaled positive at approximately 16 hours. There was growth in both aerobic and anaerobic bottles, and the gram stain revealed a gram-negative bacilli. We have a rapid molecular PCR uh, panel from positive blood cultures. We performed the Genmark panel at our institution, which was able to detect E. coli from the positive blood culture broth uh, quite rapidly within a couple hours of it signaling positive. And we were able to say, not only is this a gram-negative bacilli, bacilli uh, but this is E. coli specifically. The important point here is that in this case, it did not detect any of the AMR markers on that panel, which includes the ESBL CTXM and the big five carbapenemases, KPC, NDM, VIM, IMP, and oxalate enzymes. And so in this case, in the case at our institution, we do not report out the absence of those markers. So on the following day, our cultures were consistent with the lactose fermenting gram-negative bacilli uh, that was further ID'd by MALD as E. coli, consistent with the molecular panel. So what if we could have had the acutest AMR gene panel in this patient case? If we did, we would have identified this CMY-producing E. coli uh, that is a, an AMP-C beta-lactamase-producing E. coli that also harbored antimicrobial agents that are associated with not susceptible results to the aminoglycosides, so gentamase and tobramycin. It also harbored a JAR A mutant um, mutation resulting um, in um, associated with not susceptible results to the fluoroquinolones, and then also harbored SOL genes associated with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, uh, not susceptible results. So before I get into the impact of these results in this particular patient case, um, what is CMY? So AMPC, CMY is an AMPC beta-lactamase. The AMPC beta-lactamase can be broken down into inducible AMPC producers like the spice organisms or non-inducible chromosomal AMPC uh, producers, um, AMPC producers that like E. coli or Acinetobacter, where they usually produce this at, at very low levels and we do not see uh, the effect of this on their um, AST profiles unless there's mutations in the promoter and, or attenuator, attenuator region of the gene resulting in a high level expression. But the third is plasma-mediated AMPC. And CMY is one of those plasma-mediated AMPCs, as well as DHA, uh, which is another target on the acutus AMR panel. So what does, what does that matter? Well, the, the CMY gene, uh, so it's plasma-mediated, so it's not species-specific, unlike the chromosomal genes that you know specific organisms that may harbor it. And these genes are not, for the most part, are non-inducible, so they're already be exposed being expressed at high levels, resulting in the AMPC phenotype of resistance to penicillins, narrow extended spectrum cephalosporins, cefamycins, monobactams, and sometimes propicillin tazobactam. They're inhibited by cloxicillin and boronic acid. However, they, we don't detect these um, on a standard basis uh, clinically. Uh, CLSI doesn't have any endorsed methods. The European Committee does describe an algorithm to detect acquired or plasmid AMPC among known organisms lacking chromosomal AMPC. Um, but not, this isn't really standard practice, although many RUO phenotypic and genotypic methods have been described, such as the uh, DISC test demonstrated in the bottom uh, right-hand corner here. <clears throat> 
what about the molecular side? Do you, what about the currently available or forthcoming molecular panels? Do they have plasma mediated AMP C genes? Um, so there are none as of yet, except for the Optin Acutis AMR gene panel that contains uh, plasma mediated AMP C. And as I pointed out, um, CMY and DHA are the two on the Acutis AMR panel. There are some forthcoming, like the T2 resistance panel, that will also be um, will also have these targets. Uh, that can be performed direct from whole blood. So why does it matter? Why is it important to detect CMY? Well, treatment guidance based on whether mechanism testing are performed is now, uh, is now being described by the IDSA, and recommended treatment will differ based off of the mechanism mediating resistance. And for ESBL and AMPC producers, this is um, important because phenotypically it could be hard to distinguish the two of them from each other. And so, but the recommended therapy for an ESBL is meropenem for, um, for, um, uh, for invasive or serious infections, whereas cefepime is the treatment of choice for AMPC beta lactamases. So it's not only important to understand the phenotype, but the mechanism is also important for guiding therapy. So what could have been the particular impact in this specific case? Well, detection of CMI would help us to uh, tailor therapy. So the um, IDSA treatment guidelines suggest avoiding ceftriaxone for treatment of AMC producing enterobacteriales. And if you recall, our patient was started empirically on ceftriaxone. So the detection of CMI would al allow the, the clinical team to tailor therapy to the treatment of choice of cefepime based off of the detection of CMY. And then detection of the other antimicrobial resistant genes like the fluoroquinolone and the trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole resistant genes uh, could help um, give guidance to the team about the potential of these not being effective as uh, oral step-down therapy in this particular case. Uh, due to the severity of this patient's illness, they would likely wait until the phenotypic AST results uh, to, pro to guide oral step-down therapy in this particular case, but knowing that there is fluoroquinolone resistance mechanisms as well as trimethoprim sulfa resistance mechanisms uh, is certainly helpful in this particular case and would really um, encourage the team to wait until the phenotypic ASTs to guide that step-down therapy. Alternatively, if we could have had a, another case where there is a patient with pyelonephritis who often uh, improve after a dose of IV therapy in the ED, um, oftentimes the clinical team, because they improve so quickly, um, they often discharge the patient on oral therapy um, quite rapidly uh, and might not have the time or the privilege to be able to keep the patient in the hospital prior to discharge. And so these uh, rapid AMR results in the, let's say a similar CMI case uh, could help um, potentially guide that oral step-down therapy um, if they want to discharge that patient a little bit earlier. From an infection control standpoint, these results um, can be helpful as well. As I mentioned, it's not standard practice to detect plasma mediated AMPC for patient care. They really usually go undetected currently by standard methods. So, um, however, they have similar risks to ESBL producers, if we think about it. They're plasmid-mediated, they're easily transmissible, and they're often multi-drug resistant. So knowing a patient harbors an infection with a plasmid-mediated MC-producing organism can be helpful for infection control purposes and may require patients to be on contact precautions. So in summary, the acutus AMR, uh, how did the acutus AMR results uh, potentially could have potentially impacted this case. Well, our patient was started empirically on ceftriaxone and metronidazole. The initial gram stain and uh, NAT results of E. coli could have helped the team uh, discontinue metronidazole at that point, knowing that they were dealing with an aerobic gram-negative or facultative anaerobic gram-negative organism where metronidazole was no longer required. Uh, the acutus AMR gene panel results could have helped transition the patient from uh, ceftriaxone, which is not rec recommended for AMC producers, to the treatment of choice of cefepime. And then the detection of the additional AMR markers would have um, likely has it had the, the team want to wait for those phenotypic AST results to uh, ultimately guide that oral uh, step-down therapy in this case. So I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Riedel for case number two. Let's take a look at another case. 
Case two is a 72-year-old female patient who was transferred from a long-term care facility to the emergency department because of a loss of smell and taste on the prior day, followed by rapid onset of fever and a headache, and now with additional slightly altered mental status. The ED and molecular test for SARS-CoV-2 was performed and was positive. Because of worsening pulmonary function, the patient was transferred to the ICU and eventually intubated and ventilated. The chest radiographic imaging showed pear sheaf infiltrates in the right lower lobe and left lower lobe, at this point consistent with COVID-19 viral pneumonia. On day four of hospitalization, the clinical status of the patient worsened and a ventilator associated in pneumonia was suspected based on the various findings I listed here on the slide. The VAP protocol was initiated and a bronchoalveolar alveolar lavage was performed and submitted for culture. The patient was started empirically on vancomycin, piperacillin tazobactam, and tobramycin. On day one, two different gram-negative bacilli were identified on the primary agar media. These organisms were then subcultured to allow for further identification, and on day two, the organisms were identified as Klebsiella, Klebsiella pneumoniae and Enterobacter cloacae. What if we had used the acuitous AMR gene panel at this time for these two isolates? For the Klebsiella pneumoniae, the panel would have detected the KPC gene, the TEM gene, and the SOL1 and SOL2 genes. Associated resistance to respective antibiotic agents are listed on the slide illustrating the necessity at that point for change of the current empiric therapy and eliminating carbapenems as a treatment option. Similarly, the acutus AMR gene panel would have been used for the enterobacter cloacae isolate and would have detected the TEM gene as well. Please keep in mind that enterobacter cloacae has intrinsic resistance to the antimicrobial agents listed here. While the TEM gene also precludes piperacillin and tazobactam as a treatment option, KPC was not detected. Before I will address the impact that this testing might have had on this patient's care, I would briefly like to review some information about carbapenemases. <clears throat> carbapenemases represent the most versatile family of beta-lactamases. They belong to two major two major molecular families distinguished by the hydrolytic mechanism at the active site. The class A and D carbapenemases belong to the serine beta-lactamase group, and the class B carbapenemases are metallobeta-lactamases. Some carbapenemases are chromosomally encoded, while many others, such as KPC and LDM, are plasma-mediated and therefore highly transmissible. Furthermore, it is important to realize that enzymatic hydrolysis due to carbapenemases is not the only mechanisms of, mechanism of resistance. Other mechanisms include loss of expression of pore encoding genes or efflux pump mechanisms as an example. <clears throat> Detection of carbapenemase producing organisms is important for clinical patient care and selection of the most appropriate antimicrobial therapy. Currently, carbapenem-resistant enterobacteriales account for more than 13,000 nosocomial infections in the United States with an associated high mortality burden. The CDC defines CRE as an organism resistant to at least one carbapenem antibiotic or producing a carbapenemase enzyme. Because carbapenem resistance can be due to various different mechanisms, detection of the presence of a carbapenemase by molecular methods is important. In the United States, at the present time, roughly 50% of all CRE isolates are, are carbapenemase producers, mostly harboring KPC. Please note that the rates of CRE and CPE organisms vary by geographic region and type of enzyme. Listed here are some numbers for different uh, world regions like Europe and Asia Pacific. Now, Regulatory agencies, such as CLSI and UCAST, provide guidance regarding the detection of carbapenemases by various laboratory test methods, as well as for interpretation of results. In general, two types of test methods are available, genotypic detection tests and phenotypic, phenotypic detection tests. 
Phenotypic tests, such as the aforementioned multiplex panels, are specific assays to detect the presence of known carbapenemase genes, such as KPC, NDM, and others. Phenotypic tests have been used for some longer time now and are either growth-based or biochemical methods. Phenotypic methods are based on the expression of a, any carbapenemase enzyme during bacterial growth and culture. The most recent IDSA guidelines for the treatment of CRE are based on whether the mechanism of resistance has been identified or not. Preferred and alternative treatment options are based on the site of infection, specifically urinary tract versus other sites. Furthermore, for treatment of infections outside the urinary, urinary tract, the type of carbapenemases detected matters as well. In this regard, ceftazidine, avibactam, Omeropenem, Vaberbactam, or Imipenem, Relibactam are preferred for KPC producing pathogens, whereas Ceftazidine, Avibactam, in combination with Estreonam or Cefidericol as monotherapy, are preferred for NDN producing CRE pathogens. Going back to the case two that we were discussing, I want to emphasize here that the workup of a BAL specimen in immunocompromised patients, perhaps like this patient with COVID-19, is rather complex. Oftentimes, additional cultures for fungi and mycobacteria and other ancillary tests will be performed depending on the epidemiologic and individual patient circumstances. I would also like to highlight that some laboratories might utilize a molecular multiplex pneumonia pathogen panel, such as the BioFire panel, for workup of a BAL specimen. Such panels include targets for bacteria and viruses, as well as a limited number of resistance genes for detection of the primary source specimen. However, a detected resistance gene would not be directly linked to a specific pathogen, and this is specifically problematic if multiple pathogens are present in a clinical specimen. In this specific case shown here, such panel was not used. The use of the acutus AMR panel would have provided various benefits in the management of this patient's illness in this case. First, the respective resistance genes, specifically the KPC gene, would have been reported rapidly and allowed for tailored and more appropriate antimicrobial therapy at least one day sooner. In addition, using the panel for each of the pathogens that were isolated in this patient's BAL specimen would have allowed for selecting an antibiotic that covered both pathogens rather than using multiple antimicrobial agents. Furthermore, the inclusion of additional non-beta-lactam resistance markers on the panel would have been helpful as the patient was also empirically started on tobramycin as per the ventilator-associated pneumonia protocol. To summarize this case, let's review the impact of the acutus AMR panel on the management of this patient's antibiotic therapy. The patient was diagnosed with a ventilator-associated pneumonia and empiric therapy was started with vancomycin, piprocillin, tazobactam, and tobramycin. If the acutus panel had been used, the respective resistance genes for both pathogens had been known on day two when the patient would have been switched to meropen and vaberbactam according to the treatment guidelines. Vancomycin was indeed discontinued as no gram positive organisms were identified. Phenotypic susceptibility test results were available on the following day. However, AST results for the additional antimicrobial agents, such as ceftazidine, avibactam, would have also been available at least one day earlier. Now I will turn it back to Dr. Simner for the next clinical case. So I'm going to take, uh, finish off with case number three. Uh, this is a 35-year-old male electric electrician with no significant past medical history presented to medical care after an accidental electrocution. He experienced 25% total body surface area third and fourth degree burns. The burn wounds of the skull were complicated by a soft tissue defect in the left parietal temporal region, which is highlighted in the image here. The patient underwent excision and debridement of the scalp wounds. He subsequently developed fevers and a purulent material was identified at the site. The fluid was drained and sent for aerobic and anaerobic cultures. 
The patient was started empirically on meropenem, gentamicin, and vancomycin. The gram stain of results uh, from the drainage revealed uh, heavy PMNs and a gram-negative bacilli, which uh, on the following day from solid media, we were able to detect a non-lactose fermenting oxidase positive gram-negative bacilli, which was ultimately identified as Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Based off of the gram stain and culture growth with the absence of any gram positive organisms, they were able to discontinue vancomycin at this point. So what if we would have performed the acutus AMR gene panel uh, from the, the recovered isolate on this patient? Well, we would have detected a per producing um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, where per is a beta lactamase gene, which I'll go over in a little bit. Um, that provides resistance or is associated with uh, not susceptible results to the carbapenems based off of the acutus panel. Um, it also detected resistance genes associated with aminoglycosides and a jar A mutant, which was associated with fluoroquinolone resistance. Based on this panel result, we could hypothesize based off of the unlikely um, or, um, activity of traditional beta-lactime agents and resistance to the fluoroquinolones that we're dealing with a difficult to treat Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Before we get into treatment guidelines, let's cover what PER, what a, what PER is. So PER is a Pseudomonas extended resistance enzyme that was first described in 1993 and classified as an extended spectrum beta-lactamase. It provides resistance to penicillins, narrow and extended spectrum cephalosporins, monobactams. Um, it's inhibited by clavulanate, but not by tazobactam. And this becomes important later. Uh, the beta-lactam resistance mechanisms in Pseudomonas aeruginosa are complex, and um, multiple mechanisms can mediate resistance to the beta-lactams, whether those be some of the chromosomal beta-lactamase genes, such as OXA50, which is a narrow-spectrum oxacillinase, or the inducible AMC, uh, the PDC cephalosporinase that can be induced in this bug due to the presence of particular beta-lactam beta agents, or due to the production of efflux pumps or pore mutations in addition to the ability to acquire plasma-mediated beta-lactamase genes, such as ESBLs, APSEs, or carbapenemases. However, Pseudomonas aeruginosa can turn these on or off uh, based off of different selective pressures, and the combination of these mechanisms is what provides the variable beta-lactam susceptibility profiles that we encounter with Pseudomonas aeruginosa clinically in the lab. Um, so for the acutus gene panel, the detection of PER is associated with not susceptible results to carbapenems. And this is likely due to the isolates that they tested during the trial, uh, not only produce PER, but a combination of other mechanisms leading to carbapenem resistance and associated with uh, not susceptible results when detected by this panel. And so, so now we have this per producing um, defined as a difficult to treat pseudomonas. So what are the treatment guidelines for uh, such, such an infection? So this would be an infection outside of the urinary tract. Um, and so the preferred agents would be septolazine tazobactam, septazidimavibactam, or imipenemrelbactam. An alternative therapy listed is cephidericol. However, the problem here is that uh, we know that per producing pseudomonas isolates uh, do not respond to ceftolazine tazobactam because the PER enzyme hydrolyzes ceftolazine uh, and is not inhibited by tazobactam, so it has no activity. Uh, so the additional understanding of what is the mechanism uh, mediating beta-lactam resistance in this particular case is very helpful because treatment guidelines are telling us to go to these agents, but knowing it's a per-producing pseudomonas, we realize that septolazine tazobactam is not an option that should be considered in this case. Um, Septazidine mavibactam uh, has been reported to be associated with resistance when with PER producing isolates, and this is likely due to the combination of PER and other mechanisms of resistance. 
And similarly with imipenem, raldactam, and sofitercol, although the reports so far listed as being stable with these enzymes, there are reports of elevated MIC to these new, new drugs. And these are newer drugs, and so more data is really required to understand the activity and spectrum with per-producing isolates. So what impact could have the acutus AMR gene panel had? What's the significance in this case? Well, it would allow us to more, it allowed us to more rapidly detect a difficult to treat Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, and IDSA treatment guidelines suggest that novel beta-lactam combination agents plus or minus aminoglycosides empirically should be considered. However, because we detected a per-producing pseudomonas that um, the team could, would have probably considered transitioning to cefadericol based on the literature that per-producing isolates um, are resistant to ceftolazine tazobactam and may be resistant to ceftazidime mavibactam if there's other mechanisms playing a role in resistance here. The inclusion of the JARA mutant on this panel and detection in this particular case allows cl clinicians and laboratorians to define the isolate as a probable difficult to treat isolate to further guide therapy. And the inclusion of the aminoglycoside markers um, allowed clin can allow clinicians to discontinue nephrotoxic aminoglycoside agents earlier in this case, rather than having to wait to phenotypic ASTs to detect aminoglycoside resistance. So overall, the patient was started empirically on meropenem and gentamicin and vancomycin. So based off of the gram stain and culture growth and identification of pseudomonas, vancomycin could be discontinued. From the same day in parallel or um, after MALDI ID, the acutus AMR panel could have been set up, and within 2.5 hours, we could have potentially defined this isolate as a difficult to treat isolate. And because it harbored the PER enzyme, uh, PER gene, I should say, uh, they would have considered starting um, cefitercol and discontinued gentamicin as well in this case because of the det detection of the additional aminoglycoside resistance gene. Um, and they would have ultimately waited until the phenotypic AST results were available to make final treatment de decisions because of the di difficult to treat nature of this isolate and the resistance markers detected. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Riedel to wrap up. Now that we discussed the potential clinical utility of the acutus AMR panel, I would like to return to the AMR problem with which represents a global public health emergency of increasing magnitude, as I described in more detail at the beginning of today's presentation. While newer antimicrobial agents and treatment guidelines help address the growing AMR problem and specific organisms, such guidelines inevitably place pressure on laboratories to provide the timely and necessary diagnostic support with molecular test methods. However, some caveats need to be considered here. When phenotypic susceptibility test results don't match earlier genotypic test results, like gene detection, laboratories must develop ways to reconcile such discrepancies. Furthermore, we must understand that the absence of resistance genes does not necessarily mean that the organism is susceptible to the respective antibiotic. Lastly, as mentioned earlier, newer regulatory standards will require laboratories to link resistance genes detected by molecular methods to the respective organism identified in the specimen and culture. As one of the clinical cases addressed a patient who was diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2, I want to highlight the importance that some viral respiratory infections can be complicated by secondary bacterial pneumonias. During the past two years, most of our efforts in laboratory and clinical medicine have been directed toward the COVID-19 pandemic. At the same time, however, antibiotic utilization increased in many hospitals. At the same time, hospital onset infections due to AMR pathogens in COVID patients have significantly increased and are now higher compared to similar infections in patients with influenza during prior years. In some instances, rates have increased by as much as 134%. While COVID-19 has taken center stage for the past two years, I want to emphasize here that COVID-19 and AMR are parallel and interacting health emergencies. 
And when the COVID-19 pandemic will hopefully and eventually be resolved at some point, the AMR pandemic will certainly continue and represent a long-term problem. In this regard, I would now like to emphasize here the importance of using rapid and more comprehensive AMR diagnostic panel testing in clinical laboratory practice. The acutus AMR panel has several advantages over the other currently available molecular test methods. AMR detection and linkage to a particular organism is important. Turnaround time of 2.5 hours and an approximately 30 minute hands on time is reasonably short. And as more comprehensive panel, this panel includes non beta lactam AMR genes, including those what might be considered salvage therapy antibiotics such as colistin. The acutus AMR panel is useful in direct clinical patient care as well as in support of hospital infection control and epidemiology programs to identify and track AMR um, pathogens in hospitals as well as state laboratories. With that, I would like to conclude here that the field of AMR is dynamic and rapidly evolving. Treatment of antimicrobial resistant infections, especially those due to CRE, ESPL producers, and DTR pseudomonas aeruginosa, continue to challenge physicians and clinicians. Now, <clears throat> rapid molecular diagnostic tests such as the acutus AMR panel, can provide valuable information to guide approach to antimicrobial treatment and shorten turnaround time to implementing appropriate therapy. Further use and additional studies with the acutus AMR panel will help to better understand the impact on patient care, antimicrobial stewardship, hospital infection control interventions, and AMR development. This concludes the presentation, and we would like to thank you for your time and attention. And I'm turning it over now to our moderator for the questions and answers. Thank you, Dr. Riedel, Dr. Simner, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is for Dr. Simner. Would the acuitous panel be able to detect resistance to all known antibiotics, or is it currently limited to a certain number of antibiotics? Thank you, Mary, and thank you, everyone, for your attention. Uh, so that's a good question. So the acuitous AMR panel detects 28 antimicrobial resistance genes. And those genes are associated with up to nine classes or subclasses of antimicrobials. So in short, it does not detect all um, AMR genes, nor is it able to, to predict or associate resistance with all antibiotics. Uh, but that being said, it is the broadest AMR panel uh, currently available. And um, But a good, another thing to point out is that the detection of AMR genes and the association with not susceptible results will vary based off of the organism being identified. Thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Riedel. Besides the beta lactamases, how will all the other genes on the panel help guide therapy? Uh, Thank you, um, Maureen. This is, this is an excellent question, and uh, I think Dr. Simner and I uh, presented two cases that hopefully help illustrate this a little bit. Having actually additional genes available uh, on this panel, <clears throat> and as we, we highlighted, uh, sometimes either for step-down therapy or for combination therapy uh, or salvage therapy, um, some of the uh, agents that, that are available, the antibiotic classes that are on this panel, like the polymyxins or the, uh, the uh, fluoroquinolones or the sulfonamides, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, um, <clears throat> are actually important uh, antimicrobial agents. And it is important for clinicians to know earlier in, in order to decide whether these are even uh, possible options uh, for step down therapy or uh, the combination therapy. So I, I think this, this adds certainly valuable information in conjunction with the uh, genes for the beta-lactam group of uh, antimicrobials. 
Thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Simner. How would a lab report the result from the Acuitous AMR gene panel to clinicians? Well, that's a great question. And unfortunately, I might not have the most satisfying answer, but I could give you a little bit of guidance on how to approach this. So um, the Acutus AMR gene panel and results is uh, complex because you have 28 different AMR genes and then association with not susceptible with antimicrobial agents, which will vary by, by bug, right? So this is even more complex than even some of our standard panels that we have in the lab. Um, so it's important, this is my, my answer, is that it's important that you work with your uh, stewardship team, your infection control team, and if that, if you're not unsure who that is at your institution, figure it out, or also or reach out to a clinical champion that you're close with to help you try to convey these results in the most appropriate way to hope to beneficially impact patient care. Because we all know that these results are complex. It's even complex for you know some of us sometimes to understand what are all the resistance genes, how are they associated. So it is going to be key that you work with your clinical team to um, work on how to report these so that they're um, conveyed appropriately to uh, patient-facing clinicians so that they can uh, interpret these complex results in terms of patient care um, and in line with uh, some of the antibiotic treatment guidelines that you may have at your individual institution. Thank you. Our next question uh, is again for Dr. Simner. Phenotype is still important. The presence of AMR gene is not 100% equivalent to resistance. Can you address this caveat? Yeah, I think, um, yes, so phenotypic AST results are kind of the standard. Um, clinicians, you know, are very um, used to receiving those results over the years um, and know how to interpret these. So I think this comes back to the previous question is how are you reporting these results uh, to your clinical team so that the results are interpreted appropriately? Um, and so yes, the detection of a resistance gene does not always correlate with resistance. Uh, that being said, the detection is helpful for clinical teams to understand that it is present, even sometimes when phenotypically it's not, um, if we don't see the associated phenotype. In certain cases, uh, when we see the, those discordance, um, it's, cur it's currently recommended to take um, a, a conservative approach and almost report your phenotype consistent with the detection of that AMR because there is the probability of, um, there's the possibility that it can then be induced or expressed leading to further resistance. And so uh, the detection of those AMR genes are, um, can be pr particularly helpful. And then the second point here is that, um, as I mentioned, the phenotype, I cannot, I, I cannot um, uh, you know, express how important it is, but now with some of our treatment guidelines, as Dr. Riedel and I uh, worked through these cases, demonstrated that knowing the mechanism mediating the phenotype is also very helpful because depending on that mechanism, treatment guidance may vary. Thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Riedel. Do you suggest restricting use of the acuitous panel to certain culture types, wounds versus blood versus respiratory, et cetera? Well, this is an excellent question. Um, and, uh, you know, first, first I think I'd, I'd like to highlight that the, this panel is performed on bacterial isolates and actually not directly from the specimen, which is a striking difference to some of the other um, tests that Dr. Simna and I highlighted in some of our cases here. So by using it uh, on a particular microorganism or the ones that are um, <clears throat> highlighted um, uh, for, the, uh, for the organisms to which these 28 gene targets apply, basically do not restrict uh, the use of this panel to a particular isolate from a very specific specimen type. So I think um, I, I, would, I would recommend to, um, to um, laboratories to, again, work with uh, their local providers to identify, uh, since we're talking resistance, the utilization to specimens that come from patients 
uh, in whom resistance is really a problem, and that it would be irrespective of wound, blood, or respiratory specimen type, but rather the type of, of patient setting, uh, ICU versus non-ICU, or uh, is, is a resistance um, um, in, um, expected to exist. And I think the local antibiograms or the antiviral, uh, 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 annual uh, antimicrobial antibiograms with respect to resistance rates, particularly, would be also very helpful in kind of guiding the uh, uh, the best implementation of that panel. Thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question, and this goes to Dr. Simner. What is the value of this panel with the advent of NGS? Oh, that's another good question. Okay, so um, first off, I'm just gonna say that uh, in terms of NGS here, I'm in my response, I'm gonna be referring to the application of whole genome sequencing, which would be if you took your cultured isolate and then whole genome uh, performed whole genome sequencing on that recovered isolate. Um, it's gaining traction, you know, um, going from the research realm into the clinical realm now, we're starting to see whole genome sequencing applications in the clinical microbiology lab, which is an exciting technology. Uh, whole genome sequencing allows you, uh, can allow you to provide an organism identification, can detect all of the AMR genes present in that pathogen, it can look at virulence factors, um, it also could be helpful for outbreak uh, response. Um, the detection of AMR genes by whole genome sequencing will be dependent on uh, your database that you apply for detection, um, and but can detect a broader panel. That being said, whole genome sequencing and NGN, NGS as a whole are still very complex me methods requiring not only um, significant molecular expertise and instrumentation in the lab, but also bioinformatic expertise to be able to interpret those results. So although we're seeing um, some progress with these, um, both in terms of um, simplifying the methods and bioinformatic programs, uh, we're, we're still, for the most part, not in a area of applying these broadly across the hospitals. Uh, in the U.S. just due to the complexity of the methods. So the acutus AMR, on the other hand, and the turnaround time with whole genome sequencing can be quite long because um, depending on the sequencing platform you're using, um, so you need to take that into consideration as well in terms of how that potentially could impact patient care in terms of turnaround times and how it would compare to phenotypic results, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so from the acutist standpoint, um, the fact that it is semi-automated method um, that allows uh, most of the methods to be automated with minimal hands-on time, as well as having an automated uh, platform to uh, interpret the results, really um, allows us to um, implement this clinically into the clinical microbiology lab to uh, be a more um, uh, an alternative that might be ready for prime time, uh, that is ready for prime time over whole genome sequencing, where I think there's so much pot potential, don't get me wrong. I just think that, think for the average uh, clinical microbiology lab, um, the methods are still uh, too advanced, both from a molecular and bioinformatic standpoint. Um, thus, uh, some of these um, semi-automated and automated AMR panels are, uh, like the acuitous, are the things that most labs will be turning to to try to uh, broaden the spectrum of AMR genes being detected to help guide clinical care. Great. Well, thank you again, Dr. Riedel, Dr. Simner, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>